She found a, a perfume that was made out of rosin. This smells like an instrument. She would take Molly on tours of her apartment and show Molly her collection of double basses. She had six basses in her old apartment. Our culture pushes the, the soloist and the individual and the star forward for all the time. And I don't know about you, I'm a little sick of the hero's journey. And I think it's time to start hearing the stories of the folks that aren't considered. What's going on? It's Jason Heath. And I had the pleasure of checking out Only Girl in the Orchestra, this awesome new documentary about Oren O'Brien. Oh my goodness, what a legend in the double bass world. She was the first female musician in the New York Philharmonic and spent 55 seasons there before recently retiring. This documentary was created by Molly O'Brien, who's Oren's niece and a great set of collaborators. We are chatting with Molly, the editor for this documentary, Monique, and digging into all kinds of cool details. Really hope that you enjoyed this. And there is a live screening of this coming up real soon here. It's February 3rd, 7.30 p.m. in New York City at MoMA. We have a link for that. You can buy tickets now in the description below and it will hopefully, as you'll find out in this conversation, be coming soon to a theater near you. I really appreciate both of you taking some time to chat about the film and what a great testament to this amazing artist and what a great portrayal of my instrument that you can see in the corner over there the double bass and just this artist who is is notoriously reluctant to be in the spotlight and we've known that in the bass community but you just highlighted that for the broader public so thank you to both of you for chatting and why don't because a lot of people will be listening to the audio of this can you maybe just do a quick introduction and post your stamp bio if you want anything you like Sure. My name is Molly O'Brien. I'm the director and producer of The Only Girl in the Orchestra, a film about the double bassist Orrin O'Brien. And I also have the great pleasure and honor of being her niece. And I'm Monique Savistovsky. I edited the film The Only Girl in the Orchestra. And my, I come from a classical music background. My parents were musicians in the Met Opera Orchestra for 35 years. And you, Orrin, serendipitously. So I was thrilled when Molly reached out to me to edit the project, and we had an amazing time working together. I love everything about this film. Everybody needs to see this film, and if you can get yourself to New York when this is coming out, check it out in person, and I'm sure there'll be opportunities to see it beyond that. But from the very beginning, yeah, Mahler too. You start off at the, just the musical choices, and then you tie it up with that too, and just the musical choices throughout were just wonderful. Can you talk about, we have so many things to talk about, but can you just talk about that, like picking the music for this. If I remember right, I think I only heard double basses except for maybe a couple snippets of Prokofiev, Lieutenant Kiji. Just about everything else, I think I was hearing double basses. Am I right? Yeah, you are right. Monique, I think you can answer this question about the, the choosing the music because you were you were you you chose most, a lot of the music that's in the film and really were a partner in that. The only thing I would say is that it's important here to shout out our composer, Laura Cartman, who worked um, with Oren in the recording studio with a double bass quartet made up of Oren students. I just want to apologize to any of the double basses who are listening here that record that were on the recording. I wasn't in the recording studio. I remember Jackie Danilo was there, Don Palma, Sam Zagnet, and one other bassist. But because I wasn't there, I was it was I had COVID. So please, apologies. You're very much appreciated. I think Monique can really speak to the orchestral pieces that, that were chosen for the film, including the Mahler second. This was all Molly's vision, really. I just that I just chose certain pieces, but Molly's direction from the beginning was I want the audience to be blasted out of their seats. And so the Mahler second was was really an extension of that vision. And I think it was also something that was it was a piece of music that kept coming up repeatedly in the footage and seemed to seemed to exemplify what Molly was trying to do. When I first heard from Molly, she told me that what she wanted to do was make a film not about a virtuoso soloist. We've seen a million of these films, but it was a film about the unsung hero of the orchestra, the double bassists, the orchestra players, and Oren being iconic among them. And so... In order to to honor that unsung hero, really making the bass bass forward using pieces like Mahler's second, I think was the way to go. And so I took that direction and, and ran with it. And Molly just let me play and choose pieces that 
felt emotionally suitable to whatever scene we were using, but we're also base forward. It was always about, about being base forward, which is something that was a direction that Laura Cartman took and ran with and, and we recorded a lot of the pieces that were temp music using only basses. Yeah, including Beethoven's seventh, which ends up being really important in the there's like this through line of Beethoven seven, then I believe Dvorak, yes. New World, the second movement. And I just love the just the way the music just tied things together and that great clip of Oren O'Brien playing the Hinastera, very variaciones concertantes. And it's like this clip, this publicity thing from the sixties that she obviously hated doing those kind of things as you get into it in the film. And then it cuts to like present day Oren playing it and sounding great. She sounds fantastic on the bass and what a testament to ge- so many things genetics and playing playing an instrument like the devil bass and staying in shape and then just her spirit which comes through so wonderfully i did this interview with her back in 2017 or so and my mother listened to this and so it's audio only and she has such a youthful vitality and just this zest for life and then she started talking about all these things from the 50s and my mom was so confused she's who is this lady you're talking to and what because she sounded like a you know 35 year old person or something like that. So just capturing everything that, that is Oren, just bravo on such a wonderful job. And you've talked about this in some other interviews, but it was a 10 year project to get her to finally say yes to this, Molly? Yes, I have wanted to make a film about my aunt, Oren O'Brien and her story of joining the New York Philharmonic as the first full-time female musician with the Pro Philharmonic in 1966 when Leonard Bernstein broke the glass ceiling and hired her. I've wanted to tell that story for at least 10 years. And I asked every year and got a no. And then the 10th time I asked, I got a yes. And I think the reason I got a yes at that point was because Orrin was thinking about retiring already and having cameras invade her professional world didn't feel as daunting. Sure. And if I remember correctly, that you had the idea, I don't know if Oren signed off on it, of documenting her last year in the orchestra and then COVID hit, which like derailed all of that. And so Oren never really had the con- the knowledge that this was going to be her last concert when she played her last concert. It's true. Yeah. When Oren played her final concert with the New York Philharmonic, she was unaware of it because it was probably early March 2020 and then everyone was sent home and then she yeah she didn't come back after that yeah and also the the hall was renovated in in between that that too so there was a delay in the start of the Philharmonic starting back she's not slowing down I love that scene where she shows her date book (laughs) to to a I believe a former student of just all the concerts and the teaching uh, that she's doing that it's too bad she missed out on that moment that's a cool moment to know it's the last concert with an orchestra you've had that history with there's a wonderful bassist in the San Francisco Symphony section here Lee Crocker and she had a similar experience she was in San Francisco for maybe 40 years or so and she and what they did in san francisco is michael tilson thomas invited all the people that had retired over covid back to play Mahler's first symphony and i was lee's stand partner and i was just thinking about what it was like so i was thinking wow here's this woman who's been in this orchestra for for decades not quite as long as Orrin, but for a while and we're playing Mahler one this iconic piece and then you get to the last page and i'm turning pages for lee which is such an honor and then i get to the last page and it's, wow it's lee's last page of music and then we get to where it's only d's it's only the note d i'm thinking lee's only playing d's but Oren still continuing with the uh, manhattan school teaching and just so cool to see even though that chapter with the philharmonic has ended that she's just a vibrant professional career continuing to happen yeah i i think she would say and monique please chime in but i think she would say that she had more fun than anyone else playing with the new york philharmonic and has zero regrets and She was invited back to play as part of the team that was testing the the sonic kind of excellence or not excellence. I think she was very impressed with it in the end. And then you see her visiting, going back for a concert to the new hall and everyone flocking around her and reaching down in the film and just being so thrilled that she comes back. So I, I think it's a continuum. I don't feel like she feels she's missed anything. I really feel she feels very lucky. It was clear to me in watching the footage with the kind of community that Oren had built. And when Molly says that people want to celebrate you, Oren, it's absolutely true. She has a, she has constituents in a way. (laughs) She has this posse of people who love her and have been influenced by her and, and want to celebrate her. And so I think that continues on. That's 
seems to me a big part of her legacy. Yeah, there's this obvious love and affection that you see in these people. It's so many of the people that singing the Oren O'Brien song outside and then and then just the various encounters with David Grossman, his former student and then colleague in New York Philharmonic. And bravo on a, a, this kind of a technical thing, but capturing the double bass in a uh, in a widescreen format. I hired a company to redesign our website a little while ago and they said, why do you have to pick an instrument that's so awkward and covers up the human in a weird way. It's great for, perfect for TikTok. A little bit more challenging for a traditional film. I, what, what were some of the choices that went in? Can you just talk about some of the choices that went into like how you brought the bass to life without either being way far back or way up uptight? Well, we had an incredible um, cinematographer, Martina Rodwin, who um, is just very instinctual and very immersed in her work. And we talked a lot about the verticality of the double bass and how that contradicts the horizontal aspect ratio of any screen that um, we're going to watch the movie on. Low angles, so staying low and shooting up is a great way to get the whole base in. Wide shots are also really important, but also staying fluid and staying off tripod so that you're moving. When I first conceived of the film, I thought, oh, classical music's very formal. We should use tripods and be very steady and still. And that was just when I met Martina and, and Lisa Remington, our incredible producer, that was thrown out the window. And also another producer, Sue Kim, advised me the same. Really bringing in trusted collaborators to help figure out the visual language uh, of the film was important. So we kept very fluid. And then, of course, of course, having Monique choose what pieces of the footage to use is important. Yeah, Martina gave, shot the double bass in a way that made it more human, more organic. And so there were a lot of details there that really brought the double bass to life, which is precisely how Oren talks about the double bass, the instrument being alive and temperamental and having emotions of its own. And so I was, I was lucky in that way that I was handed this embarrassment of riches, this treasure trove of beautiful footage of the double bass that made it feel human and like it was moving all the time and breathing and so I was very lucky. I didn't have to do much work in that regard on my end. <laughs> but you take a, such a sophisticated and layered approach to just the, the title right out there, The Only Girl in the Orchestra, right? That's what, and something, I, when I interviewed Oren several years ago, I, I put out on social media, I think my email newsletter, what do you want me to talk about with Oren? And guess what came back first by a, a you know large percentage is like, what was it like being the first woman in an orchestra? And it's a more complicated question than that it sounds because she, the, it's not like a woman had never set foot on stage at, at the New York Philharmonic. And then also there is... It, there's a very real uh, reluctance for a section player, regardless of whether you're the first woman or not, to ha be in the spotlight at all. And the way that you capture that is just so beautiful with those cringing stories from the 60s of the as curvy as the double bass and just the, and laughing at that uh, hilariously, horrifically, however you want to frame it, dated journalism. So I just love the way that was approached. And I remember Oren saying to me, why don't people, I, she found it more notable that she was the first German player in the section of the New York Philharmonic or that she was the first Fred Zimmerman student in the New York Philharmonic. Oren says over and over again, there was a harpist. She was there before me. I was only alone as the only woman in the orchestra for one year. She qualifies it a lot, I think rightly so, because she doesn't want to take credit where, it, where credit isn't due. But what she doesn't sometimes acknowledges how important it is to all of us as women out in the professional world to know the stories of the first woman who actually was hired full time by the New York Philharmonic. That is true. And she did do that. It's also true that she did not enjoy the publicity that surrounded it and stick is sticking with that story. <laughs> she really did not. She didn't like it. She, she chose the double bass for a reason. It's a background instrument. It's not. She didn't want to be a soloist. She says that very clearly in the film. She didn't want to be a soloist. Her parents were soloists, right? Oh, and the way that comes up is just so cool. And, and then where it's introduced in the documentary and that her parents were, yeah, like movie stars being in the spotlight and that whole story and how it unfolds. Yeah, it adds a lot of context to that reluctance. And then also this New York kind of 
only murders in the building kind of uh, makes you just want to be there vibe. I mean, from the from her old apartment that she had to move out of because it started rotting away all the time to uh, moving around the city of uh, Molly, you picking up her base and her instructing you on how to do that. That's Monique. Monique, talk about <laughs> there's so much more that I wanted to show. And when, when you reference the New York flavor, um, there, there are some some really great scenes that ended up on the cutting, cutting room floor that were shot on Molly's iPhone, actually, that just added so much of that New York flavor and texture that I'm thinking about Oren's cologne that she would wear, that she would show you how she would go to work wearing this. I, I, I think she wasn't allowed to wear a perfume in the orchestra, but she had a, she found a, a perfume that was made out of rosin. Is that right? <laughs> Like a double bass. It's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. smells like the double, it smells like an instrument. And so she would sneak that in and she sh she would take Molly on tours of her apartment and show Molly her collection of double basses. She had six basses in her old apartment and I think maybe five made it, migrated to the new apartment. And these are instruments that were circa 1700s. And she, yeah, she took us on wonderful tours of the paintings and the art in her apartment and showed us drawings that Fred Zimmerman had gifted to her. And so there's so much of that New York flavor that just didn't make it into the final edit. But yeah, I feel like Oren's life is synonymous with New York and her career is synonymous with New York. And I remember that from my upbringing with my mom being the, she was the fourth female musician hired by the Met Opera Orchestra. And what that world is like for women who, like you, I, I, going back to your earlier question, you had talked about Oren resisting that narrative of being the first woman musician in the New York Philharmonic. And I think as an orchestra player, you do resist that narrative as a woman. You're a member of the orchestra. That's the more important thing. And my mom talked about that a lot. She had doors slammed in her face all the time. But being part of that world in New York, a member of the orchestra, it's it was the height for her, and I suspect for Oren as well. It was doesn't get better than that. This documentary is a great introduction to the double bass as well. I just I am so delighted that something like this about that instrument in the corner there is making it, its way out into the broader public. It's just enough information. It's not a documentary about the double bass, but I, I just love the the way Oren covers it and the way that you portray it and show it and. and Talking about the cutting room floor, I know that when I interviewed Oren, I came over with two and a half hours of, of conversations uh, from that one conversation. And I've talked to several or four students with these awesome three hour dinners that she would have with all kinds of people. So I'm sure you walked away with a lot of footage. Like, how do you make the decision to make something X length? Like this, I, I am sure this could have been four times as long. I think it is the perfect length. It is just such a beautiful, the way that the story tells, it feels like it's like exactly as long as it should be. But like, how, how do you make those decisions? We spent a lot of time talking about, well, what theme do we want to choose that will be the, the framework, provide the framework for this story? Um, and at the end of the day, the one that, really stood out to us and seemed to honor Oren and Oren's life lesson the most was the story of the unsung hero. And any footage that didn't fit within that theme, unfortunately, <laughs> seemed to meander and seemed to be about something else. And so that ended up being our, our, our guiding light for how to tell the story, how to keep it to a length that we felt made a lot of sense. Otherwise, it could have been a series, really. <laughs> yeah, so it was the theme of the unsung hero and Oren's final lesson about not being afraid to play second fiddle was really what we stuck to. Yeah, she, well, filmmaking is a collaborative art form and so is orchestral music making. And that idea of honoring the collective by uplifting the unsung heroes by uplifting the background players, but because without them, as she says in the film, the floor falls apart. We need our double bass players. We need our background players. We need the producers behind the directors in films. Our culture pushes the, the soloist and the individual and the star forward for all the time. And I don't know about you, I'm a little sick of the hero's journey. And I think it's time to start hearing the stories of the folks that aren't considered the star of the show every time. I'm more interested in those people.
Well, that's what's such a cool thing about the documentary art form, how it lends itself to that. And I'm, I'm a big documentary nerd, so I'm just curious how something like this, did that theme, did you just start, because I have no idea how they're made, really, did you just start following Orin around with a camera and then the theme came about as a result? Like how, how, at what point in the process did the Unsung Hero theme kind of become the direction you, you wanted to go? That's a really good question. It emerged in the editing room. Okay. And we... We shot a little and then we edited a little and then we shot a little and we edited a little. And, you know, the most cost effective and most sort of television production way of doing things is you shoot everything and then you edit it or, you know, or you even start editing before you're done shooting, but you do not stop and start. And we approached the film, um, Lisa Remington, Monique, Martina, myself, we all have other jobs and this wasn't we really wanted to take the time that this film needed. So it was two years in the making once I got the funding for the film. And there was a real flow back and forth between the edit and the, and Monique would edit something and then we would talk about it. Oh, let's go, let's go, let's go shoot this. We need a kitchen table conversation. That, that whole kitchen table conversation between Orn and I was born out of conversations in the edit room. So it was a real kind of checkerboard back and forth. And not necessarily a traditional way to make anything, but I think a very productive way to make something. Oh, I love that kitchen table conversation. You're like eating Chinese food or something like that and talking and all these like great life lessons are, com are coming up. And I, I love, I just, Molly, I love your role in it too. I, I, I don't know, I don't know what you call that aspect of documentary filmmaking, but you're not the main character, but you're a character. And just that, the first line with Orin, I just something like, my niece is the director. I told her not to do it, but she's disobeying me or something like that, which just sets up Orin's great sense of humor and just a premise of the film so well so many takeaways. I just want to toss out there that it's ironic that Orin is a reluctant participant in, in some of the scenes and Molly, we had to really convince Molly to step into the role that she ultimately played in the film. Her, myself and our producer and, and cinematographer really had to say, Molly, nobody knows Orin better than you do. And you, this is organic to your relationship that you do sit down and once a week have these dinner table conversations or lunchtime conversations. And these life lessons and these themes are something that were, it's not the first time you heard them, Molly, you've heard them for years. And to be able to share those lessons that you were lucky to hear all those years with an audience is what we were hoping to get. And so we pushed her in that scene sometimes. <laughs> I was reluctant to put myself on camera because it just felt, again, like maybe it's genetic. I didn't want to be narcissistic. Uh, it's not about me, but it's about Oren. But I think what you would call me is the straight man in this film to Oren. She's the comedian, comedian, the lead. I'm the straight man. Yeah. That's great. Molly, what was it like? I, I think you said in another interview that you hadn't, you've been producing, but you hadn't directed in like a while, right? So that was like 10 or 20 years or something like that, if I remember right. Yeah. What was it like being back in that role? Oh, it was so fun. I really had so much fun. I loved it. Directing is its just much more personal and more vulnerable, especially in a film that's personal like this one about a family member. But even if you, I think even if you're, I've never directed a true crime series, but even then I, I produce a lot of things and I, directors are just, they take the work much more personally. They choose the work much more carefully. Producers and I'm one of them. We can produce multiple projects at once, have them at all different stages. It there's and we care very much about the work, but there's something about being a director which just it's just more it comes more from the heart. You're responsible for the look, for the feel. It's like the buck stops with you. So it's much more intense. I really enjoyed it. I had a great time. I'd love to do it again. That's great. I, I love this this documentary. Like I said, it, when it popped up in my in my newsfeed or my email or whatever, I was like, are you kidding me? This I DM you. I DM oh. you. Oh. Yeah, because I knew that Orin had been on your blog. That's how, I think that's how you find, found it. Okay, must be. So I'm just, I'm so grateful that this is out there and that you had the idea and it ended up coming out like it did. I will, I will obviously link to the website. I will send people to pick up tickets at MoMA, right? Uh, yeah. And it's going to be out on February 3rd at MoMA, but of course, over the next year, we're going to do many festivals and we hope to have a sale to a streaming platform, PBS, The New Yorker, New York Times. We're not sure. We've just engaged a sales agent, but we're very confident that we're going to find a permanent home for it so that more people can watch it online once this theatrical window closes. 
Sounds great. Yeah, folks, I will link up to the Only Girl in the Orchestra website and go and just make sure you follow along. So if you can't make it to New York, which try to make that showing, but if you can't, hopefully coming soon to you in some capacity.